what was your, how did you and Richard Lowenstein meet? Uh, Richard just appro- approached me, rang me up and approached me out of, out of the blue, I think. Uh, and then we hooked up and had a chat and like kind of figured he was obviously a real fan of Worldly World and stuff, which was how he come, came to me. Um, we got on really well and just I agreed to do the job. I mean, I was working on the Northcote City Council at the time. Right, what were you I, doing? Was I was your day job? builder's labour, <laughs> builder's labour, I was doing really hard work. And, of course, I took up the job of being musical director on a film. It was much more appealing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I quit my job and went and did that. Describe um, meeting Michael Hutchins for the first time because that Rich, Richard had him pegged as the, the star of the film. Yeah. Do you remember first meeting him at that point? I do first remember meeting Michael and it was like he had a really cool flat in uh, South, Yara, South Melbourne. Um, I think it was South Melbourne. A really, you know, really wealthy person's flat. Uh, like he didn't rent it, but someone had rented it for him. Um, but for this guy's a rock star. <laughs> so my first impression of him was he just had exuded rock star. But he was cool. You know? yeah. I liked him. Yeah. But it was a, it was a bit, uh, it was a bit intimidating. Yeah, right. When I first met him. And of course, it turned around the other way, <laughs> and I intimidated him. <laughs> so anyway, you give him the song "Rooms for the Memory" yeah. to to uh, record for the soundtrack. Yeah, I've got to talk to you about "Rooms for the Memory." It's an incredible song from start to finish, Ollie. Thank you. Uh, it it went number eleven in this country nationally. I think it got number five in Melbourne. Yeah. Um. And it showcased Michael in a way that we hadn't heard before within excess because it wasn't necessarily a commercial sounding song and yet it's so hauntingly beautiful and so memorable. Do you remember the writing process of that particular song? Yeah, I worked pretty hard on that song. Um, the initial, the rooms for memory thing came out of going to hospital, a friend of mine was in hospital. I had to sit in the waiting room and there were memorials on the walls. For, in memoriam, the clock on yeah, the wall. Yeah, the plaques on the wall, the clocks right, on the wall. Right, that's where it comes so, from. You know, the, so rooms that had been donated by people who died and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, that's where that whole thing came from. And then I created this riff uh, and then it had all kind of came together. But I worked pretty hard on that song until I was happy with it. And it was a lot older than the Dogs in Space soundtrack. Uh, I wrote it in the early World War days. And I said to Richard, I've got this song that I think you'll really like, and he loved it. And that's how it came about, and then we went about recording it. And I'm, I'm a real fascist when it comes to people doing my vocals because I have to sing it like me. So I got Michael to sing it exactly like me um, because that's how it works. And then the phrasing and all that kind of thing has to be like me. Um, otherwise I won't have part of it. I got him to do his own thing to a degree. Um, there were things that were very Michael Hutchins towards the end, but the whole structure of the song and that was very much my thing. Um, yeah. You recorded that at Richmond Recorders, is that Richmond correct? Recorders, and we did a little bit in another studio, but I can't remember which one it was. Was Tony Cohen involved at that point? Uh, I can't remember. I don't think he was. Uh, Nick Lornay recorded that one. Uh-huh. Um, so would you, who was a great producer, so mm. still is. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, he recorded that. What did you think when you had the final mix of Rooms for the Memory? I was very happy, yeah. Yeah, I was very happy when I heard it on radio. It kind of blew me away. Ian McFarlane, the music journalist, said uh, once... Rooms for the Memories was released. It only confirmed your commercial potential. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. But was, was that, you weren't going for commercial potential, no. were you? And you've never been about that, have no. you? No. I mean, this is sometimes I write poppy tunes. Mm. Um, it's never been a, I've tried to write pop music or anything like that. Um, there have been points where I've kind of had a crack, crack at that, but it's never real. 
Like if it comes out, it's just if it, the pop element comes out when I'm writing something, that's fine. Mm. And I'm not going to be a snob about it. Mm. Um, but I find it, it's all popular music if, until someone. It's like that great quote of Louis Armstrong, all music's folk music because <laughs> I never heard no horses sing. <laughs> So, yeah, which I think is true. What did you buy with your first paycheck from the Dogs in Space record? Oh, God, I don't remember. Uh, oh, probably a sampler. Um, I, yeah, I think it was a sampler and a drum machine. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's when I made the jump to forming No. Uh -huh. It was after that. Yeah. Because you Skin had and Bone had had a thing. Then I went for no with samples and drum machines. So. so talk me through no. That, again, featured a number of people that you'd work with in the Skin and Bone Collective. Yeah. And it was noisier and crazier. But it still had structure. There was still oh, great I mean, elements. I thought, it, I thought it was pop music, really. Uh, I mean, at the time I was working in a record shop called Pipe Imported Records, which I used to go and buy my German music from when I was a teenager, um, but they were a very funny record <laughs> store. I mean, they sold German cosmic music and death metal. <laughs> so I was getting this kind of weird crossover between the two that day when I was when I was working there at the time, and then I'd go home and put music together that was like that. Yeah. So there's a cosmic, cosmic music and death metal. I stuck the two together <laughs> and no came out of it. Um and influenced a number of Melbourne musicians at yeah. the time. I mean, I think it's fair to say that Snog, David, David oh, yeah, Russell, sure. was definitely a disciple of, of No. Yeah. And um, that whole, I guess, uh, electronic scene that, that kind of stemmed out of that at that point. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the titles for No, which, again, were quite quite humorous. Glory for Ship for Brains yeah, yeah, yeah. is one of them. Um, you also did a reworking, and it's interesting because you mentioned him before, Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced as well? I love that cover. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really good to do the Hendrix song. <laughs> uh, once we were scum, now we are God. Yep, yep. I mean, these titles speak for themselves. Um, glory for the Shift for Brains was really about we demand our glory because we've been treated like shit all our lives. Um, and once we scum, now we are God is the same thing. It's really just a reworking on the same thing. How was taking No out onto the stages? Um, it was fantastic. I mean, we did a lot of great shows. And um, I think like by the end of our career, we were doing huge shows. And we had you 2 turning up to our shows and stuff like that. I think that um, No influenced New 2 actually because it wasn't long after that they did Up to and Baby and they were using samples and Things like that, and no, I think that they were a little bit influenced by no. How did you two end up at a no show in Melbourne? I don't know. <laughs> Richard Lowenstein maybe brought, brought them. Okay. Because around, and, and I might be getting my timelines mixed up, but at some point you work on the Echo Homo record. That's right, with you two. With you two, which Bono sings on the B side of and one of their the Edge releases. Plays guitar. Yeah. And the Edge Play. So talk me through that. Well, that was weird because. Troy, you know, uh, Troy, Troy Davis, Davis was Echo Homer. Was Echo Homer, but I also was, and so was Gus Till. Right. Oh, and the second one, Gus wasn't involved, but I was involved in both of them. And um, Troy had this amazing knack of impressing people, and he impressed you too. He made a clip with them and stuff, um, but he convinced them to come in and make a record, even though Troy wasn't really a singer or whatever. Um, so he just go, come on, we'll put some beats together and I've got my friends, you too, and <laughs> they'll come in. And sure enough, they came in and they were drunk as anything. And um, I got the edge to just play guitar and I just recorded it and then sampled bits that were good and got the bottom to do the same thing, got him to sing over it and then sampled him and played him in. That's how he did it. So it was all just constructed like that. It's... It's bizarre, but yeah. brilliant. Worked. <laughs> was that your only meeting with, with you two? No, I'd met them after that because um, we got on really well and they'd invited me to their concerts a couple of times, so I went to see them play. 
which was quite interesting because I thought, geez, they got a lot of hit songs because, you know, I, I knew nearly every song <laughs> and I don't, never owned a YouTube album. So. It was interesting that Michael Hutchins also appears in the uh, Motorcycle Baby yeah, video yeah, right. of Echo Homo. That's right. Well, he was a great friend of Troy's. Yeah. So let's go back to Michael Hutchins. He, again, he has this top 20 hit in Australia with Rooms for the Memory, your yeah. song. He contacts you a few years later to work on what he initially thought would be a solo project. That's right, yeah. That morphed into Max Q. Yeah. Do you think do you think he was inspired by the Rooms for the Memory song so much that he felt that there was obviously a great working relationship there with yeah, you? Yeah, I do, I do. Um, basically, he called me up when I was working in a record store again. Pipe Imports. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was another no, one. This one was Collector's Corner. Collector's Corner. They're still around. Oh, I, I remember them, yes. Um, and he called me up there and I said, oh, well, I've got a few tunes that I've written, so maybe you'd be interested. He got me to come up to the hotel and play him. Of course, I had to go to the hotel. He wouldn't come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to... Uh, so I put the tunes on for him. He really liked them. And we just kind of started working from there. We did like two or three tunes at uh, Rhinoceros Records in Sydney. And I got my friends to come in and play on them. And then that turned into a whole album. Because he was like, oh, this is so great. I've got to keep going with this as a group project, not a solo album. So which was great. So mm. it turned into Max Q. How was Michael's management in excess management, how were they <laughs> in relation to him working with you on a solo project? Yeah, well, they weren't good. No, they were really, Chris Murphy, he didn't want to do it. So he, he tried he, everything he could to make it seem like it wasn't Michael uh, doing the project. So he couldn't have, Mike, he didn't want Michael on the cover. He didn't, you know, all those kinds of things. Michael's face had to be obscure in the videos. Um, he had to, Michael had to cut his hair. I think it was Michael's choice, actually, to cut his hair. Um, but anyway, um, it was really terrible. Do you think that was a control issue because he was worried that Michael would have success with this particular yeah. project and maybe that would, that would uh, I guess, put in excess in a, in a precarious position? I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think it really mattered that he had two bands. You know, I don't think it would have mattered at all. Would it would have helped each other. Um, it worked out that way that it did. I mean, you know, so what if Max Q made a, a gold record? I mean, it just means Michael got more money. <laughs> mm, mm. Uh, it's no big deal, really. With Max Q, you recorded the song Way of the World, yeah. which subject-wise is still as pertinent today as it was when you recorded it back in 89. Yeah. What was going through your head at the time when you were writing those lyrics? Pretty much all that's in the lyric. Um, again, it's a song that I really worked hard on. I have to say, of all the songs I've ever written, it's probably the one I wrote, spent the longest working on. I remember when I was writing and I was sitting on a balcony and just working really hard on the words, going, oh, it doesn't work, I'll try this, you know. It's the first time I've ever really done that because I had this, I'd already had written the music and I was convinced that I had a good song there. So um, I just worked very, very hard on it. And look, a lot of those things are like, uh, whether it's got all the bomb, it's just the same, it's only fair and another name. I mean, they're all things that I firmly believe. Um, and... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm essentially an anarchist. <laughs> so I kind of, they're very anarchistic lyrics. Mm. And it was great seeing a song like that in the top 10 or whatever. Mm. Um, because it actually got me into the, um, into ASIO. Is that right? Yeah. What, they investigated you? Yeah, Michael told me. Because <laughs> Michael Hutchins had so many um, connections and he told me that I'd I had, um, they were keeping an eye on me because I had these lyrics. Whether it's God or the bomb, yeah. it's just the same. And all, the, all the stuff about yeah, money and banking. Well, and... yeah, because I think the opening lyric 
is you are born with a gun to your no yeah. with a gun to your head. Yeah, you are born into this world, world with looking a, down the barrel of a gun. Oh my goodness, Azio. Yeah, that's nuts. It is nuts. <laughs> I don't know if I believe it or not, but Michael Tolman had an awful lot of connections. Yeah. So, um, it still gets played on commercial radio to this day. Yeah. Do you still do you still see royalties from a that? A tiny one? bit. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, he did sometimes, um, yeah. which opens up the Max Q album. Yeah. Um, how was he singing your lyrics? Because he came to you initially with with songs that he'd written, and yet I reckon about ninety percent of that Max Q album is Ollie Olsen. Oh, it is. Yeah. 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 So how did that work? Did did things change in the recording process? Well, there were, there were things where we'd collaborated. Uh, where I'm going, I look over the lyric and I go, "Oh, that doesn't really work. What about this lyric?" And I, I was kind of teaching him at the same time about lyric writing, and then he taught me how. He did it, did it, so he had, it was really collaborative because mm. um, it was very short, um, short recording sessions. Like we didn't have, it wasn't like in excess of mood, didn't have months to make an album. We had a month to make an album, so or maybe a bit longer. Than was it month. done in pieces then? Yeah. Yeah. It was. Um, we did all the recording up in Sydney and then we went to New York to finish it. Uh, now, in New York, uh, of was a famous name who worked on that record producing it. Was it Todd Terry? Todd Terry, yeah. Who's really big in dance music circles back in the 80s. That's right. Certainly he was amazing. working with Madonna and, and other um, famous artists. Yeah. Um, how did that come about? Well, I wanted him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Michael was like, who do you want? And he wanted to get Bob to the mountain. Oh, right. And I'm like, nah. <laughs> it's more rock, to get someone more contemporary, you know. <laughs> and uh, I had a choice of Marshall Jefferson or Todd Terry. They were both very hip at the time. We got Todd, which was great. Now, had you been to America before you went to New no, York with? No. So how was that for you? It blew my mind. It totally blew my mind. In what way? Ah, oh, everything about it. I mean, New York was really great at that time. Um, still lots of graffiti and lots of gangs roaming the streets and all that kind of gritty stuff in New York. It was a bit scary, but... Um, yeah. It was scary, what, compared to Melbourne? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, compared to Melbourne it was. <laughs> yeah. People were carrying guns and shit. You saw that? No, but you oh. could tell. Oh, okay. So, I mean, it's, it's just it's America. You know? Yeah, right. Wow. So. And you go on a promotional trail of sorts in America while you're there as well. I did, it was With later, my, yeah. Yeah. Talk but, me through that. What do you remember about that time? Because... I mean, obviously, within excesses management, they didn't want you promoting the record well, too heavily. Well, the thing is, Michael didn't do it. I did it. You did most of the promotion? I did nearly all of it. How'd you find that? Well, I was just on the phone all day and it was really ridiculous. It was very boring because I didn't, the people that were interviewing me didn't know anything about who I was. And so I had to fill in all this background information and basically repeat myself over and over and over again um, and never gaining any new ground. So it was really boring. Um, Michael did a couple of interviews with me, like the ones on MTV, and mm -hmm. that's about it. Yeah. Uh, he, he didn't do anything. He just hung out at the hotel and put his feet up. Goodness so, me. Yeah. <laughs> Michael once said about, about working with you, Ollie isn't supposed to hang around with pop stars and I'm not supposed to hang around with punk types. The band is made up of rowdy friends from Melbourne. These guys are good musicians who've never had a chance. Most of them have never been into a studio. They are real underground people who don't have any money. Some of them have never been on a plane before. They were worried that working with me, they'd lose their underground status. I don't think they're worried about that at all. <laughs> I don't think they're worried about losing their underground status. I mean, everybody was sick of being underground. <laughs> so it was actually really good to get fed and um, get some money and catch a plane and all that kind of thing. I mean, they all had a great time. <laughs> and we had someone come in, a really great cook, come in and cater for us every night um, when we were recording. I mean, how fantastic is that? This is in Sydney at Rhinoceros. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Michael Hutchins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we were, and the food was great. I mean, we weren't complaining about that at all. Michael and yourself couldn't be more unalike. What do you think you represented to him? 
I don't know. I think my anarchic streak probably he really liked my, my sense of humour um, and my cheekiness. I think he really liked. <laughs> um, I don't really know. You'd end up holidaying with Michael in Tahiti. That's right. You quoted that as one of the best holidays of your it life. Was. It Why? was. Oh, it was. Oh, it's Tahiti. I mean, <laughs> you know, you'd get up in the morning and jump off the balcony into a lagoon. I mean, how good is that? Was Michael paying for this or was it? He was. Yeah, right. Well, actually, I paid for some of it because um, it was staying in Bora Bora, which is off Tahiti. Um, and people, locals call it boring, boring. <laughs> um, but I found it anything but boring. It was gorgeous. It was so beautiful. And um, yeah, just snorkeling around and doing all those great things. It was just fantastic. Were you close at that point? With Michael? Yeah. 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 We just made an album. So oh, we'd done, we'd made the album, but we hadn't mixed it. So we were kind of working on the album a little bit while we were having a holiday. So had debt tapes and we were listening to them and deciding what we were going to do and that kind of thing. And, of course, around about this point, he's dating Kylie, is that correct? No, he was dating um, this girl called Johnny. Ah, this is yeah. pre-Kylie Minogue. Yeah. But then on the on the promotional tour, which is later, mm -hmm. um, he came into my hotel room and he goes, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, what's going on? And he goes, oh, I'm obsessed with Kylie Minogue. And I said, well, why don't you just call her? And you're Michael Hutchins. You know, you can do these things. And he, so he did. Yeah, that, that was that. Did you see him much after that? Yeah, no, I saw him yeah. and Kylie together. And yeah? What, what, what were they like together? They well, were great, yeah. yeah. Was he still obsessed with her? At the time, yeah. Yeah. You know, they had an argument. I was at a party one night and they had an argument. And... Um, Kylie wanted to go home, so I walked her home. It was really funny because I'm walking her home and down Oxford Street in Darlinghurst, and this guy in a full um, bow tie and dinner suit comes out with like a Hasselblad camera, starts popping off shots of us. And it ended up in TV Week and that, like, <laughs> <laughs> who's the mystery man? In? You got papped. Yeah, yeah, I got paparazzi, <laughs> exactly. So it's just like totally weird. I wish I had that photo now. Yeah. Just one more thing on the Max Q record. There's a brilliant song called Ghost of the Year. Yeah. It's kind of prophetic in a way because yeah, Michael essentially did become, in 1997, Ghost of the Year. Yeah. Did you ever had discussions about death or, you know, what was going through your mind when you wrote that song? That song went through a few, quite a few permutations and I wrote it back in the Woolly World days. In fact, some of the lyrics I'd written in Young Charlatans. Um, it was part of a song called Drowned, which I'd written in Young Charlatans. So it goes way back. And then I came up with this new chord progression. I thought, oh, I could call it Ghost of the Year. I just kind of came to my head. And I put the lyrics of Drowned to it. It worked really well. So that's how it happened. Um, so it's this serendipity that turned out to be Michael's death and um, that song. It's funny because I went to a barbecue. Um, the Farris brothers invited me to a barbecue, which was interesting because they never invited me to anything. Um, but it was just after the funeral and stuff for Michael. And that that song was playing in the taxi on the way there. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so it's a bit weird. That's bizarre. Yeah. The, lyric, the chorus is, now they want to crown me for the ghost of the year. Yeah, yeah. Where were you when you found out Michael had died? Um, it was really horrible. I mean, I found out I was just at home getting up, getting having breakfast. The phone rang and I picked it up and it's this guy going, I want your reactions to Michael Hutchins' death. It's a guy from the newspaper. <laughs> it's just like, how the hell, firstly, how the hell did you know my number? Secondly, how did he, you know, what the hell's going on? So that's how I found out. I said, I don't know. And I hung up on him. And then I started getting phone calls all day and it was awful. 
What do you remember about the funeral? It was a star-studded affair. Nick Cave played Into My Arms. It was telecast. Harry and Miller ended up taking the publicity rights. Obviously, supermodels flew in. Kylie was there. What do you remember about the day? I remember it being pretty weird. And the whole thing was pretty weird. I mean, having televised and stuff was... I mean, Michael wasn't the king of England, let's face it. I mean, mm. he's just a pop star in Australia. Mm. Uh, they should have just had a much more private affair, I reckon. Mm. The after party was ridiculous. In what way? Uh, if, you, if, you, if you had a silver ticket, you'd go into the real after party. Which oh, my with, goodness. Which was with uh, Kylie and, and all that. But if you're in the B-grade, great. You'd get all the lesser people, which included Michael's dad and which I thought was bizarre because I spent most of the time talking to Michael's dad who I really liked. Had you been in much contact with Michael up, up to his death? I mean, he was with Paulie Yates at that point. Well, a little bit. Um, just prior to his death, he'd called me and said, I want to get together and talk about a new album. Wow. That was like when he was in Australia. Like he wanted to talk to me about doing a new album. So, yeah, that would have been very, very interesting to see what that would have, would have happened with a new album. Because um, I'd have changed a lot since then and I'd have learned a lot of new electronic tricks, things like that. So I reckon it would have been very different. Mm. I got a, uh, an offer to remix Max Q sometimes and it did, we did it and I sent it to Michael. Never heard back from him. So I ended up releasing it on Say Harmonics. Uh-huh. Because <laughs> it was very wild. Yeah.